Um, I hope you're all joining us here today for another uh, one of our lunch chats. This is the Emergency Preparedness Lunch Chat. I'm Greg Walsh. I'm the Emergency Manager for the City of Salem. Uh, today, our topic is actually emergency communication. And part of this really goes into emergency planning. So this, this part of this and the whole thought concept here is that we have a plan to let people know where we are or what's going on, or we have a plan on how to make sure people feel confident that we will be okay, or that we have a process for that. Um, and Kathy, thank you very much for joining us as the co-host from the city of Salem. If you are interested, uh, she just posted the video or the link to YouTube. Um, so if anybody wants to share that, again, all of our previous videos are up on YouTube, on the City of Salem YouTube, where you have a little playlist now of all of our previous lunch chats and some of our other uh, presentations that I've done. Uh, and if you have any questions during this, please throw them in the chat and I'll probably answer them at the end. Um, and then at the end, uh, currently everybody's muted and uh, at the end I will unmute. So if you have other questions or I'll allow people to unmute. So if you have your own questions and you want to have that conversation, we can do that. So really the two the two biggest thoughts on emergency communication doing this as part of your plan first off is your standing guide standing orders standing guidelines you know in the military we know them as standing orders right this is in lieu of any other direction or any other information this is what i'm going to do because this is what needs to be done or the right thing to do um and this is what um this is what we'll need to do to be successful so sorry Gonna mute my phone. Uh, you can hear the fire engine going off in the background, maybe. Um, so the first thing is talking about um, in some disasters, communication systems will fail. This is the challenge. This is the problem that we run into, right? We're all used to, you know, I have two cell phones. I have my work cell phone. I have my personal cell phone, and they both ring nonstop for me. Or, you know, I get text messages or messages from all different apps and different devices and everything else, but. In some emergencies, like earthquakes, um, cell towers may either fall or cell equipment may fall off buildings or be damaged. But also, a lot of cell equipment connects to hard lines that run across the states and go through massive switchboards and massive centers like um, the Verizon Center that's up outside of Portland near the Nike facility. Huge Verizon switchboard system process. They have backup power. But if those lines get cut and they start to get severed or a section or area gets severed, that's it. There's no cell phone communication. Um, and that's, that's concerning for a lot of people. And that includes landlines too. You know, it's same, same thought as landlines all connect to a giant switch, cell phones connect to towers, which connect to giant landlines. Um, so if you can't use your go-to regular communication, what are we going to do? What's that process? What's the thought? How do we successfully deal with an emergency situation where um, we actually have to have people or have a process for communicating or to make sure that our loved ones are safe. Um, again, that's always one of the things that I talk about is making sure your loved ones are safe and there's a process for that. So how do you and your family get back in touch or get back together if you're apart when something happens? Um, so I spent some time, um, and these are kind of those, those top thoughts, the, the overview, and we'll talk about each of these individually. So standing guidance, right? This is talk through it, talk through it before it actually happens on what people will do depending on where they are um, to set those expectations. Now, I really encourage people to write these down kind of in an order of operation of what you'll do, um, especially for kids or family. You know, for me, this is what I do for a living. I do this all the time. So I'm always thinking about, oh, if I'm here, how am I going to get home? If I'm here, how am I going to make sure that my wife knows where I am and what that process is? Um, how will I get home? How can I notify her? How can I do this? So these are uh, thoughts I constantly have. Again, this is what I do for a living. It's kind of my job. If I didn't do this, I'd be a little worried. Um, so really thinking about how we do that um, and then writing it down, just basic plans, even if it's a, you know, in a notebook that gets updated sometimes just on a piece of paper that goes in the Ziploc bag with a copy of your ID and some other basic information, a paper map. Um, you know, I go to travel Salem and I get free paper maps fairly often. And, uh, you know, I go into the Salem section and surrounding area and draw, you know, the major routes. Then I have the Oregon map where I can look at, Hey, I'm at annual training for the national guard in Umatilla. How would I get home? 
Um, you know, what roads do I follow? If the gorge is all messed up, how would I get down to Redmond and then back into the Salem, you know, coming down that way? So I am that person that like looks at the map and thinks about all of this. And, um, you know, part of that is what does it take? How long will it take to get there? Now there's radios. Um, AM radios, as soon as we can get it up, we'll be broadcasting information, emergency, sir, where you can go for emergency help. But then there's also getting your own radios and different types of them. Um, and what does that actually require? There's a whole bunch of different types. So I have a slide on that here in a few minutes we'll talk about. And then there's different satellite communication options, whether it's a satellite phone, a satellite connector, um, a satellite communicator that connects to your phone. Um, and then there's even what's now the mesh network connection, which is not quite the same, but um, I'll talk about that here in a few as well. Sorry. Um, okay. So here is a, a conversation about standing guidance and um, what are the decisions that need to, need to be made depending on the situation? Now, this is um, kind of starting off. Is it a fire? Is it a flood? Is it a volcanic activity? Um, earthquake is kind of the big one that I go with because that's kind of the biggest concern we have that will cause the most disruption. So that basic start, what is my first thought is check and care for yourself. Are you okay? Um, and the people around you, can you get help if you need it? Um, what are you doing with pets if you're with them? There's a lot of people that think, um, you know, their pets will listen. There's unfortunately a lot of videos of earthquakes, uh, where dogs just take off or cats run away because they're scared. They don't know what to do and they just take off. So what's that going to turn into? How are you going to find them or control them? Um, do you have access to supplies? Are you, where your two weeks ready kit is. Are you, do you have access to your vehicle? You know, I often hang my keys. I walk into my office and I hang my keys on the hook. That's right, up, right above my desk. But I realize that, um, that means I either have to remember the code to push the buttons in to unlock my door, or I have to break a window to get to my emergency supplies that are in my car. I'm kind of okay with either of those. I also know the code. So that's, that's something that I, think about, you know, is my phone, do I leave my phone on my desk or do I stick it in my pocket? So if I had to get up and evacuate or run, it's with me. Um, just some of those things that I think about and, you know, kind of work through about getting access to my supplies. Cause I'm, again, I'm prepared just about everywhere I go. I even have a bag underneath my desk. So if I had to hide it on my desk, I'm okay. Are there any immediate fires, literal fires, um, or just immediate things that you need to deal with right away? Um, are you safe or can you get somewhere that will be safer? Um, so I often think, you know, I work downtown. I'm in fire station one right next to the trade center and the, the grand hotel. And I often think about all of the brick unreinforced masonry buildings that are downtown. And, um, you know, that's a concern for me. So if I'm driving by them and something happens and we make it through the, you know, I, I dodge any buildings that may have fallen, but am I safe? Do I want to try to get somewhere safer? Do I want to get to the park? Do I want to get to where there aren't going to be other buildings or hazards fall trying to fall on me? Um, is there somewhere I can get that will be safer? Um, what are you concerned about and what are your priorities? Is it getting home? Is it getting to work? Is it checking in with your family? Is it getting to your kid's school to pick them up? And then I have this note here at the bottom as a bread come, the bread crumb backup. And uh, this is something that I often talk about and I'll probably, I'll talk about it now briefly, uh, but this is just one of the original thoughts that my wife and I had when we moved here before we really built much more of a communication process and talked through it. But it was, it's this bread, bread crumb, um, kind of thing in Hansel and Gretel style, but actually the picture on the right side is this neon pink duct tape with unicorns and rainbows on it that is in all of our emergency kits. So we have it at home, we have it in my car, I have it under my desk. Um, my wife has it in her car, she has it at her work. You know, just a little bright pink duct tape with unicorns and rainbows on it, kind of unique, and then a Sharpie on it. A Sharpie, usually we roll a Sharpie into it, just the first inch or so. And our thought here is we generally know the primary place will be I'm at work, she's at work, we're at home, um, or, you know, one of the few other places that we will go. But we have plans on how we'll get places. And part of my thought is if she was at home, and she evacuated to our friend's house, um, is to actually 
take some of this duct tape, stick it on the door, right when she left, where she was going. And then actually, as she hits telephone poles or turns, major turns that she's going to take, she turns off, you know, up one road, um, you know, she puts some duct tape on it and writes the date and time when she was there and when she was passing. Um, if she gets picked up by somebody who's going in the same direction, you know, a little bit of extra support, whether it's friends or just, you know, somebody that's willing, going in the right direction um, to, you know, find a telephone pole, do two stripes around it write who it was, where you, they were taking you, where they were going. Um, and if there was a, like, you know, any change in plans. Um, so that way we actually had a bread, quite literally duct tape breadcrumb trail that I could follow her and know where she went. Um, and kind of the same deal is for me is as I start leaving, if I leave work, I'm going to leave a note, you know, a piece at work at the telephone pole that's on the corner or the power pole at the corner. And leave a note. Hey, this is, I was here. I, you know, I'm okay. I left at this time. This is where I'm going. Um, so it's kind of one of those last ditch effort things of just something that we've always talked about to do and uh, just a way of one last option for communication. All right. Uh, so standing guidance. This is, this is really one of my thought process charts that I tried to make to help people think through this. Um, and I get it. It's, there's a lot on the slide, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to start with really the basics. I'm going to, I'm going to get my little annotation out here. I've got my red line and we're going to start off with, uh, let me, I'm going to move this out of the way. Uh, there, let's say, unfortunately there was an earthquake. Generally you're at a few different places, right? You're either at work, because most of us spend, you know, eight-ish hours there. You're at home, you know, 12 to 14, or you're traveling somewhere. You're either in between the two, or you are actually traveling somewhere else. So these are kind of the three courses of action that I recommend people plan for. So this is when you sit down with your family members and you think about that plan. So if we start off, hey, we're all at home. That's great. The first question, you know, as we go down the line is we're at home. Uh, is everybody with you? Yes. So I have my people, my pets, everything that I want with me that I'm concerned about is with me. Great. Then we just ride down the line and we go straight to you're prepared and everybody's accounted for. That's our ideal goal, right? That's that's our end state here is you're prepared, you're safe, and everybody's accounted for. Um, now, if we, if not everybody's with us, do we know where they are? Are they at the grocery store? Are they at work? Are they down the street visiting a friend? Um, and then have we planned for them at this location? You know, if it's work, that's a very common thing. You know, my wife, she, we live in West Salem. She works just outside of West Salem. So that's actually part of the plan is that she will get home because she doesn't have to cross any rivers. She doesn't have any bridges. She honestly just has roads and a hill. So we feel pretty confident that she can get home, even if she has to drive a little bit and walk, or she can walk all the way, um, with no major, major obstacles. For me, I work downtown, as I said. So I have at least the Willamette and the bridge and whatever else that comes to be. But also it's my job to respond to these things. So that's kind of part of our conversation is she has to get home because I'm not coming home. It's my job to respond and manage this. Um, you know, is it kids at a school? Is it at doctor's appointments? You know, something that may be frequent. What is our plan for them at that location? Now, do they have a plan to get home? This is where we get that. Yes. Hey, we've talked about it, them being at work. This, so I feel good there. We have a plan and we have a plan to communicate. Great. I feel like I can get home or if I'm home, my wife can get to me. She has a plan on how she's going to do it. She has a plan to communicate and then she's going to get home and we're back to the green block of we're prepared and everybody's accounted for. Um, if not, can they communicate? Did we have a communication plan? Did we, does she have a satellite communicator that she can reach out and say, hey, I'm at this place. How do I do this? Right. And then she can pull out her paper map. She can start looking at roads. She can start taking directions, doing measurements and start to make a plan on the fly. Right. That's, that's why we keep maps. That's why we keep compasses and some of these other things. Um, but again, if we identify those places that we visit frequently, it gives us time to plan now, right? Because um, planning now is a lot easier and just having a plan in place, obviously plans might adjust when it happens, but this is kind of that thought process, right? Um, 
Now, again, if we're traveling, one of the first things is, do we need to get home? You know, this, my note up here in the corner is if you're out of the impacted area, do you need to go into it? Right. That may be, hey, your entire family is on a road trip. You're all together. Your pets together. You are out of the area. You're in Idaho or Montana and everything's good there. Sure, your home is potentially destroyed and disrupted. But if you come back in, first off, how are you going to get back in? But also, what's going to be here for you? And are you going to put a strain on resources? If you're coming back in, can you bring resources in to repair your home? help your neighbors, help the other people in the community. Um, and in some situations, they might not let you back in. Unfortunately, we've seen during wildfires, people wanting to go back into the zone to get their pets, um, you know, and other things or keepsakes. And the, the roads are just closed. They're blocked. We put traffic control points so people can't go into the disaster zone because it can be, it can be more hazardous if people are going back in. We won't need to think about that a little bit. Um, if you're not impacted, how can you help those that are, right? If you don't need to go home. Now, again, can you get there? Yes. Is everybody with you? Yes. Great. We are back down that tree of we have gone back down and we are getting home where we need to be. Um, if you can't, how far or how long will it take and what's the plan? Right. That's that's one of those things that is really important. If I can't communicate, what is my plan? What is my thought? Um, after having a couple conversations about evacuations, I actually did this in a different slideshow where I showed the map as to what it would take for me to come go from downtown Salem to the Redmond airport, for example, you know, we talk about disruptions all the way up and then Redmond airport is likely going to be one of the first airports that is safe to evacuate from, or, you know, easy evacuations that we don't expect to be severely impacted. Well, that's like 128 miles, which is identified as 43 hours of walking um, with a 6,000 foot elevation change up and 2,000 feet down. Um, that is significant. That is, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day. If you're a fit person that can do 10 to 12 hours a day. So what do you have to take with you? What's that look like? And that was just a thought about evacuations getting out of the zone. But if you were coming back in, at what point, how far can you drive? At what point do you have to turn into carrying things? Is carrying things an option? Do you have a wagon? Do you have a four-wheeler? Can you get an ATV while you're not in the impacted area and drive it back in? You know, that might be your might be a good solution. So again, just thinking about these things. Um, and then at work, this is one of those things that again, first off, do you need to go home? No, you're prepared at work and you're you're all set. Good to go. Stay there. Try to be try to be safe. Try to be helpful in any way you can. Take care of others. Can you get there? Right. Here's the big thing. Yes, I can get there. Cool. I'm only a few minutes. I only work a few minutes away. I'm at home. Go through this checklist again. Um, what obstacles will you face? Will you face bridges, overpasses, rivers, streams, collapsed buildings? All of these other obstacles should be accounted for you as you look at these plans. Right. I, it's easy for me to say like. I can drive home in 20 minutes, you know, or, you know, 15 minutes, whatever it is on a regular day, I'll be able to get home. But do you know how many times you cross streams or bridges or overpasses or culverts? Um, what happens if there's no lights on at the intersections that are controlling that? Are people just driving straight through? How fast are people going? Do you have a mountain bike that you can ride? And that's a little bit easier, but how do you get across the river? How do you deal with this? How do you get across the streams? Um, and bridges that may be out. Are there alternate routes that you can go that avoids major bridges or, uh, you know, bridge crossings? So really, it unfortunately takes some sitting there with a map and looking through it or just driving the route, different routes a couple of times and finding roads that you can bypass major intersections. Um, so again, just really got to think that one through. It's easy to say, yes, I can get there. But if the bridges are out, if the roads are disrupted, if there's no power, how are we getting there? Really got to think that one through as standing guidance. Um, what do you need to do to get there? Or do you have an alternate meeting place? Personally, we have alternate meeting places with friends around town and, uh, you know, in the community. So we work with our friends and different, uh, we have an organization that we work with that we're, you know, one of our friends runs. Um, so that's kind of our backup. Hey, we can get there if we're in South Salem. That's part of our plan is 
that's a little easier to get to than getting across the river if we have everybody with us. Um, but again, if not, my dog's at home, I want to get home to him or my wife, you know, same deal. Um, if not, and you need help, where can you go? Is it, you know, a friend's house? Is it a fire station? Is it the boat maintenance shop that's in West Salem on, you know, uh, by the elementary school or Walker middle school? Yeah. Um, you know, how do I get to where I need to go and what help do I need? Can I rely on or can I look for? Um, because, you know, some people say like, oh, I'm going to the hospital or I'm going to the fire stations which is great, but we're going to have a lot of other things to do. Fire stations, our firefighters, our primary jobs to go put the wet stuff on the red stuff. I mean, it really comes down to, we need to get out there and put the fires out um, before that becomes a secondary hazard while we still have water. Um, the hospital primary purpose is to evacuate and get people stable as best we can. Um, so trying to get there, you know, really think about how that plan would work and think about what they'll be doing when things go sideways. Um, this is just my kind of thought process that I've tried to put together to help work through this thought of doing standing guidance. Anyways, got a few minutes, got to get on to the next few things, and then we'll get to a uh, conversation. So radios, all different types of radios, uh, CB radio, uh, FRS, so that walkie-talkie type, the general uh, GMRS, so licensed, ham radio licensed, great option, um, the multi-use radio service for VHF. Uh, communications, low power radio services, and AM frequency for emergency uh, information, as we talked about. There is so much out there about radios. And I, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, if you are interested in figuring out what radio works for you, there's a lot of resources out there. I can't tell you what's going to be best for you. I'll tell you that we have ham radios throughout the city of Salem, uh, part of our CERT program. And we have, uh, we recommend ham radios because we have the ability to communicate from different CERT caches throughout the community through ham radio. And it's a very powerful tool that is relatively inexpensive um, and you can get a license pretty easy for it. Um, and you can reach all over the city and all over the region. Um, we actually have the ability from Salem Hospital to talk to Samaritan Health in uh, Corvallis over our, a ham radio network. So just to tell you how powerful that is, um, that's again, kind of commercial use of it, but we have operators throughout the community, all types of different things. Figure out for radios what works for you. Um, personally, we have walkie talkies, but that's kind of our, our thought of like, if we're close, but we actually, so getting into satellite communicators, there's a few different options here, personal locator beacons. And that's just I can, if I have access to the internet, I can pull up a map and I can see where you are. Now, this is great for hiking, um, you know, snowboarding, backcountry stuff, and for people that still have cell service or Wi-Fi. So for example, if I had a personal locator beacon and I turned it on and I was moving with it, my parents who are back on the East Coast, they can see that I am moving and have a little bit of confidence of, <laughs> hey, I'm up, I'm moving, that's great. But there's no communication with that. Now there's one way or two way communicators. Again, that uh, personal locator beacon is an example of kind of that one-way communicator. Um, there's different, there's the spot SOS uh, that is one-way, there's some one-way communicators. And then there's two-way communicators. So examples of that is the Garmin InReach, which um, Bluetooths your phone, or they have the, Inter the Explorer SE and the Explorer, there's another one, Explorer S and Explorer SE, um, which you can actually message from that device. Spot SOS, this is actually, so quite literally, um, it looks like an old Blackberry, but this is what my wife and I have. So we have the ability to turn these on and text each other. So these generally live in our cars, or if I'm going hiking, I take it with me. Um, we chose Spot because uh, what's nice about this, I mean, it's satellite communicator, so it's going through the satellites. I don't have to Bluetooth it to my phone if I left my phone on my desk, um, or if I'm just out of service. It's not relying on my phone battery, which is great. The the some of the other things are relying uh, obviously if it Bluetooth. But what's great about this is I actually have my own number. I set preset messages, which I have unlimited of. Uh, I, my wife and I. Uh, so this a lot of these come with a monthly subscription. So it's eleven dollars a month for me to be able to text my wife through a satellite and my family and anybody else, and I'm super okay with that. I find that you know as an initial purchase. Uh, was I think 170 bucks for each one, which 
we saved, we had the discussion. My wife and I really planned for it. We saved up for it. We, we had this as our thought. So we chose to do this. This was a, an active thought process and a plan for us that we can communicate. So no matter where I am, I can turn this on. I can send messages to my wife. I can send messages to my family back in the East coast. I can put other people's phone numbers in and send a preset messages message. And, uh, there is a way to turn it on, turn it off and turn it on. So you don't have a monthly subscription. Um, and for me, I, we thought about having my parents again, who are on the East coast, probably not in the impacted areas. Hey, if this ever happens, here's our account information, log on, turn it on. Um, but we, we honestly just wanted to, we, we test them kind of monthly. So we, we decided to just leave it as a monthly subscription. That's okay for us for 22 bucks a month. I know I can text my wife anywhere, anytime. And that works. Um, and I can do it to either her device directly or to her cell phone if she's somewhere else. Uh, there's other brands out there. So there's somewhere, Bivy Stick and Zaleo. Um, those are great other options. Um, there, again, a ton of research uh, out there, um, a ton of information out there. If you're looking for uh, satellite communicators, there are satellite Wi-Fi hotspots now. So Globostar, which is uh, one of the primary sat phone companies, uh, they have a little Wi-Fi router so you could actually connect you know, so many devices to it and then use your regular cell phone over Wi-Fi essentially. Um, and then there's Iridium Go, which is another brand that has that. Sat phones are an option, but they are quite expensive. I actually have a sat phone from work and it is just this giant thing that actually still has an antenna and still has the fold around. I mean, it is, it's a beast. Um, it's old and I can make about 10 phone calls on it before the battery dies because that's how old it is. Um, so I have that from work. It's literally part of my job to carry it. So it stays in my bag, but um, it's, it's a great, it is an option, but again, personally, I find this a lot more useful, a little satellite communicator, two-way texting uh, as a great option. Um, there are mesh communicators, which again, that's something else that will Bluetooth or connect to your device from a, with a cord. And basically once you get into range, it starts communi communicating. Um, and what's great about that is if you are out of range and you come into it, it'll pick up and relay everything. But if you were over here, somebody is in the middle, with the same device and then your family member comes in and they connect from a further distance away, it transmits, it continues to build that network through mesh. Um, so it's quite literally, they can key together. And as long as there's a mesh co connection of multiple devices that bridge that gap, it will connect all the way through. Um, so again, good option if you're close or you have a bunch of family members and you're kind of close to each other. Um, but really have to figure out what the benefit is for you. So I um, already talked about the breadcrumb plans. So thank you all for listening to this. I am going to um, stop sharing for a minute. I'm gonna let everybody um, go to the thing. So if you want to unmute yourself or you have questions, please go ahead, take this time, uh, ask questions. I have the chat open. You can unmute yourself and you can ask questions. Um, but all in all, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for thinking about this communication. Um, you know, standing guidance is a great start to any emergency plan. Um, really how we operate best. It's kind of one of those things. And then otherwise, consider different devices to make sure that you can communicate or uh, know somebody that does so you can get a hold of them and go through them. All right. Uh, so any questions, comments, thoughts? If not, thank you all very much for joining us again for this uh, next lunch chat. Uh, and I hope to see you, I believe it is October 6th for the next one. Yep, two weeks um, where we'll be talking about pets and preparedness. I think it's pets, Kathy, right? Pets, I think so. I think pets are our next one. Yes, pets uh, should be our next one. Uh, so talking about planning for pets and emergencies and just some of the thought process on that. Great. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great day uh, and we'll see you all soon.